Uh, hello everyone. Uh, just a quick forward before the video, you can use the chapters to skip ahead if you'd like. This is a re-upload of my world refreshment video that I did just before Christmas. Many of you likely never seen the video as it was age restricted about a week after it went up. I will talk more about the why of that at the end. Uh, you can skip ahead if you'd like using the chapters, but uh, the theory I have is that YouTube misflags some words as certain other words. If you are here for the second time, I appreciate your continued support to see if the algorithm will once again smile on this video and to get its performance back up to what it was before. Uh, I have chosen to simply silence the words or the parts that I think were causing the issue. I felt this would be less disruptive than beeps or something else. Uh, hopefully it won't spoil the video too much for you. Now, let's get on to the video proper. Greed is a strange thing in the world of Fallout. Again and again, we see it the primary driving force behind some of the sickest and the cruelest things we come across. Be that human experimentation, exploitation, arms production, murder, or some combination of the four. Well today, at the World of Refreshment, we're gonna see all four of those, displayed in vault -Tec level of shenanigans. Today, we're going to take a look at the dark secret underneath this theme park attraction, a secret that plays into the overall cruel narrative of this whole DLC, which we shall get into in time, a secret involving Cola Quantum. I've added in some timestamps so you can skip ahead to said secret if you'd like. However, before all that, let's take a look at the ride here itself, the cheap attempt world made to cover this dark and twisted heart. As soon as we enter, we are greeted by the sight of three things. Mire lurk eggs, two corpses, naked, and glowing water. None of these are ever a good sign. The naked skeletons with no context is a returning theme here, and given the presence of clothed ones as well, I believe there's a reason. Next, your sight will likely be drawn to the giant phallic bottles, pouring what you would correctly surmise is a radioactive substance onto you. Now, the recorded voice on the telecoms claims this is a river of Nuka-Cola Quantum, but it's, it's just called water in the HUD, and it doesn't seem to provide any of the perks Nuka-Cola Quantum. So already, we've been f lied to. A little further in, we arrive at the next stage of evolution for the common house mannequin, an animatronic, pantomining how a thinks chemical engineering works. The voice then goes on to say that Brad Burton, founder of the corporation, invented cola back in 2042. This dialogue, along with the remainder of the entrance dialogue, informs us that even pre-war, cola was sheer filth. After this, we get to one of the funniest sights here, a group of people I genuinely believe died on a river barge ride. The classiest way to spend your last moments. I say believe as their skeletons actually look like they died where they lay, as opposed to the others we find here. I don't think all of the completely exposed ones are victims of the lurks, but the sheer numbers of them and the odd positions, at least to me, suggests at least some of them could be. It makes sense too, given the extreme numbers of lurks that were present here, until we rolled in at least. In this wonderful Wild West setup, the recording tells us of a great example of cola trying to capitalize on the then currently wartime strife in America. It states that Coca-Cola Victory was a drink made available out west. This is of course in reference to the lack of victory against the foe in close proximity to their borders at the time. Here, we also find our first body of a gunner. They have quite a story and world which we shall cover in part in this video. For now, all you need to know is their excursion here has not gone particularly well, which I believe this fellow, at least, makes obvious. Further on, they go on about the flavors available on the East Coast, as well as the upcoming release of Cola Quantum, which is first being visited on the East Coast in all of its poisonous glory. Then, we see the inevitable progression of all soft drink providers, a weak attempt to get into the adult beverage market. Here, we find one of the few skeletons that I believe could have been pre-war, possibly just slamming down one too many of these tasty cola that have an eye-watering 35% content. Jesus wept, it may as well be moonshine. In the back room of this lovely display, we actually get one of the few terminals, aside from the horrendous ones we shall find beneath this complex, that tells us about the employees of this fine establishment. The first set of entries are memos to the staff, and some of them are just fantastic. 
The first is in regards to the grand reopening. The place was closed for a month, and all the staff were given a very generous unpaid vacation. This is accompanied by an extremely unsubtle threat to appear lively and happy, or you'll be replaced by an animatronic, which as we know, always ends well. But it ends on a happier note, even if you're low on energy. It's okay. The river itself is pure quantum, and composed of such hardy chemicals that it kills all bacteria. This makes me question what it would do to the healthy bacteria in your system, but I'm sure it's a small price to pay for being able to drink like an animal at a watering hole while at work. The second entry covers the first victim of automization, and of course it was the only fun section on the whole ride. Some absolute space cadet seen fit to fill the bottles with actual cola dark, and given its high level of jungle juice, it makes perfect sense that someone would be drunk mere hours into the shift. It seems Jenny was the one that ruined it for everyone, and I wonder if that wasn't her body we find in this section. Some poor guests lost their glasses, but apart from that and Jenny's possible skull fracture, it all ended well. After this, an entry admonishing the staff for trying to liven up their soul-crushing workplace. Some of these costumes are, to be fair, a little odd to have appeared in the ride. That being said, it's, it's not like continuity actually matters in any way, shape or form on this ride. So come on, let them live a little. The prank entry is just unbelievable. A man was blinded. Turning a bottle into a makeshift grenade that you'd expect an insurgent to use is not a prank. It's an attempt on someone's life. I do not think Randall will think it's hilarious. I think he'll get his own back with a prank of similar severity, and it will be completely and utterly justified. The next three entries here are just the scripts that were present, I assume, before full automation had occurred. I love that even here, someone has subtly hinted at the damage Cola does to your heart in the form of palpitations. The next entry highlights how Cola Wild can aid one in the exploitation and subjugation of animals that are just trying to live their lives. I hope that Bronco ends you, Roy. Finally, the last one highlights some woman's unholy tolerance for drink, and that it takes something of 35% to actually help her unwind. Overall, it's the type of cringy stuff you'd expect from a dead-eyed writer. Next to the Cola Dark exhibit, we find a perfect blend of capitalism and the military. A suit of Cola branded power armor. Now, I don't know if people were actually fighting on the front lines in these, but if they were, I'll admit, that is some genius PR right there. Imagine it, being able to run ads in the papers about a recent victory as some headcase stands in a cola branded suit of blood soaked power armor with an American flag in their hands. The Patriots would be creaming themselves. The rest of the ride tells you how the taste is created and it's probably a complete and utter lie. 17 flavors my whole. Lastly, it gives you an overview of the facility where quantum is produced in all its blue glowing glory. We'll get into the content of it later. It's... it's not good to say the least. Now, there's a fair bit of employee back corridors that thread throughout the ride, usually overlooking the river of quantum. But the next thing we want to look at is the corridor leading up to the control room for the ride. Here, we can find more evidence of a last stand by the gunners, the results of which will soon become apparent. Then, we come to a control room of sorts, which contains the only note in this part of the facility. It tells us that someone called Casey was heading to the roof to determine if something that happened was just a military drill. This likely refers to the bombs dropping and the action taken either immediately before or after by Brad Burton to lock down the entirety of the park. We'll talk more about the roof at the end of the video. For now, time to descend into the plant itself. Here, we find the remains of the gunners uh, this search party is actually referred to in terminal entries on the Bradburton overpass. However, that feeds into the overall gunner story here, go world. For now, we shall consider ourselves with a hollow tape from Corporal Downey, in which he gives us some insight into what happened to the gunners here. This is Corporal Downey. As far as I know, last living member of Sergeant Lanier's recon team. We tried to secure the bottling plant and got overrun by some new breed of Meyer Lurk. I've never seen anything like them. Blue glow, so strong, stronger than any Commonwealth Lurk I've encountered. 
It's gotta be the quantum running through this place. We breached their nest, and they... They poured out. We felt bad, but I'm pretty sure one of those damn lurks made off with my leg in the process. Private Clay dragged me to safety before I sent him to warn the others back at the camp, but... Uh, I could hear their screams from here. I know that help's not coming. And I'll be damned if I'm gonna be food for some mild lurk spawn, so... I'm taking this matter into my own hands. This is Corporal Downey. Signing off. For good. So the gunners here were sent to this facility to secure it. However, they either underestimated or were completely unaware of the presence of lurks. Due to this, the entire team was wiped out, with Corporal Downey ending things himself before the lurks got to him. Given the comment about being food for the spawn, I think this does slightly add some credibility to my earlier observation. The observation being that the bodies were piled up the way they were may have just been past victims arranged so that the spawn would have an easy food source. In the plant itself, there isn't actually much else to see. There's a single skeleton near the quantum vat, and apart from that, just a surplus of cola of various flavours situated throughout the plant. I had hoped we'd see more of the employees in here, but I guess they either made it out, or their bodies aren't here anymore. We can find the breach to their nest at the end of the factory. Now, this isn't where the story for this place ends. In fact, it's not even remotely close. However, it takes the restoration of the power to the world, after the DLC's main quest concludes, to get the rest of it. We can find the rest of that story through the locked doors near the corpses of the gunners. Immediately inside the small room, we can see a poster that talks about the walls having ears and eyes. This, to me anyway, is a small bit of foreshadowing regarding the paranoia and misplaced ideals that we're going to be exposed to here. Not the only dark secret in the world, but definitely one of the sadder ones. The elevator at the end of the room takes us to a small bunker beneath this facility, and it's here that we finally find out the secret behind Quantum. When we step off this elevator, ignoring my power armor squatting in the corner, we see the two main chambers that will be of interest to us in this section. The one at the back has a further three chambers off of it, and four central workstations, with a terminal making five. The four workstations are not random, and were staffed by the four individuals we should be learning about in this area. At the back, a broken viewing window can be found, looking into a room with a reactor in it. You can already probably tell where this is going, but to spoil the surprise, yes, it is involved in quantum. The room to the left of this has several chutes and vats, likely where the practical part of the work we shall learn about was performed. Take note that, so far, we haven't found a single body. Well, don't you worry. We're about to. Heading back into the main corridor, we now take a look at the living quarters we can find directly opposite the elevator. The place looks like it has been turned over, with bottles, both cola and other, strewn around. Parts of it are destroyed, or have fallen into extreme disarray. It's important to note that no one else, apart from the four we will learn about, has been here. So whatever happened here, it happened due to their actions, and it happened a long time ago. Heading up the stairs, the first room is empty, with parts of the wall panels having fallen into the room. Besides that, it, like the other three rooms, is actually fairly spartan, and quite small overall. Not really the type of space you'd want to have to stay in long term at all. Unfortunately, the room across from this tells us the first part of the horrific story that went on here. We find a bed pushed up into the far corner of the room, and a skeleton with its skull separated from its body on the floor. The skull has a pretty ghastly look on it, which, along with what's on the ceiling, further reinforces what went on here. This person seems to have taken their own life, and lay where they were until their body had decomposed enough that the head separated, and the whole thing could escape the Remember that, this body appears to have been left here the whole time. The room at the other side of the stairs is in a similar state of disrepair as its neighbour, and apart from that, doesn't really give us a lot to go on. However, the one opposite this one contains yet another body. A woman this time, going off of the clothes. Nothing overt to tell us how she died, but again, she was left here after it happened. There's a holotape on the desk beside her, but I've already picked it up. It's accompanied by three more, 
and we'll get to all of that after we read through all the terminal entries, back inside the main room with the four other workstations. There's quite a large amount of them, so if you want to skip ahead of the holotapes, I've marked them in the video. Now, let's take a look at what was really going on here. We finally learn the names of the four people living here, all doctors in various fields. Rex Meacham, Edmund Medford, Kevin Bennell, and Ruth Levitt. Their entries are grouped into two sections, research logs and user logs. Inside the research logs section, they appear to be organized into four entries, all titled compound and then enumerated using a series of letters. I'm sure you can guess what the Q is, but let's take a look through all of them anyway. The first, L3N2, states the current isotope was not suitable for the uses. It results in the release of toxic fumes as a result of internal thermogenesis. It's a pity the fumes didn't kill him. Would have solved a lot of issues that we're going to see later. The next entry, M6N5, is unfortunately horribly corrupted and gives us little information beyond that it reached semi-stability. However, it's fair to assume that something still went wrong, given it wasn't the last compound that they attempted. After this, we get to the first Q4N7 entry. We are given the first bit of information of what they seem to be trying to preserve in the compounds, strontium-90. The substance stays liquid, even at high temperatures, and no longer emits fumes that kill you. The thermogenic reaction is likely an explosion or an expulsion of some sort, and the part about wanting to achieve safe radioactive thermogenesis seems to back this up. The electron subfield likely refers to the field of strontium-90 itself, and then there's this final bit at the end. It had a nice blue glow. This, whatever it is, is what goes into Cola Quantum. The final research log details their success. The thermogenic trigger, which is presumably what they wanted the whole time, is achieved with the substance maintaining a liquid form. However, to me at least, having it been volatile enough that an impact will set it off is a huge design issue. Being safer than nitroglycerin is a low, low bar, and having a stronger yield if something does go wrong as far as I'm concerned, negates any increased safety. They seem to have developed it into a weapon called the Nuke, and the substance is going to be named Quantum. They sign off by saying it's time to test it on beverages. Now, I don't know how the validity of it being an explosive was addressed for the drink, but clearly, given what it does to bacteria and its radioactive nature, it surely wasn't enough. Also, note that they had the compound perfected at least before the drink came along and the drink reached full distribution before the bombs hit. This means they had already achieved a great deal of success when the bombs had started dropping. This is important given what happens later. Next are the eight user logs from Rex, and they escalate quite rapidly. The first entry talks about the founding of the lab. Yes, that was a real reactor in the back, but it's totally safe, it's fine. A man called John Caleb set it all up, and this is also the first mention that we get of Project Cobalt, which links into, well, quite a lot of what was going on in the world as a whole. Spoiler, everything was a front. Now, why a guy who makes beverages is qualified to work on what they worked on, I have no idea. But here we are. Next, we have an entry several months in the future, after some development crunch time. Given the talk about something to show Brad Burton, I assume this is after the initial entry about Quantum. The talk of testing seems to indicate that they had more plans for it, beyond what they talked about, and we hear for the first time how Levitt wasn't happy about this at all. The next entry seems to have occurred just after the meeting, and after the final research entry detailing the Strontium-90. They want to apply quantum to weapons, and their initial tests seem to be showing great progress. They then admit that the slightly tweaked formula is only relatively safe, which means really not at all, given their track record. Quite a bit of time seems to have passed between this entry and the bombs dropping, given that Quantum was already available as a drink at that point. After this, they originally named the soft drink, and to avoid conflict with Levitt, she is put in charge of making it instead of weapons. Here they touch on the DC factory, which I covered years ago in Fallout 3. I'll link the video, but I think a redo, given all the retcons and the amount of time that has passed, is definitely due. They went through at least three failures, before a fourth that only had some pretty bad side effects was chosen. Because at COLA, the safety of the people is of paramount 
to not relevant in port. After this, Meacham basks in his own success, and we get a reference to the overall health of Brad Burton, which actually plays into the overall ins and outs of Project Cobalt. Somehow, despite the side effects, Quantum is projected to be a bestseller, showing that the average consumer was already dumb enough that further brain damage wouldn't have really affected their daily lives. After this, uh, things escalate rapidly. Uh, he's killed Ruth, and apparently had no choice. She was going to betray them all. This had occurred after the bombs hit, so they have presumably been locked up here for a while due to the park lockdown Brad Burton started. Don't worry, the hull tapes fill in what the terminal entries leave out. Next, we find out it hasn't been a while. It's been about two weeks, give or take. Now we learn that Edmund is the individual that himself, and if it wasn't clear, Ruth, the woman upstairs. He admits he isn't really processing any of this, i.e. he's breaking down and he decides to just keep working. He begins to unravel, thinking he can turn the tide with his miracle weapon. They also admit it's still unstable, so thank God they at least acknowledge that before putting it in the hands of soldiers. The last entry is the Cherry on this shit show Sunday. They've been stuck together for about a year, and Kevin decided he wanted to leave. Meacham calmly ascertained he was clearly a spy and tried to kill him. He says he hit him several times before he slipped off through a tunnel behind the reactor, and decides, eh, that was probably good enough, he must be dead. I also want to point out that this means they left both those bodies up there for over a year, just sitting there, decomposing. So the four of them were working on a compound for a weapon. They discovered a semi-stable compound, dubbed it Quantum, used a watered-down version to make a totally safe drink of the same name. Then they got stuck down here when the bombs hit while they were perfecting it. Meacham killed Levitt, or Ruth, by her first name, and Edmund, life. Kevin stuck it out for a year, and then Meacham killed him too. However, it feels like we're missing parts of the story, parts that give us context to all of this, and the holotapes dotted around the facility give us this context. The first one can be found back in the room we assume was Ruth's, given her body is there. The first is Meacham recording AB-27. Don't take that tone with me, Rex. You know exactly why I'm pulling you aside. You told Brad Burton our team would work on Project Cobalt without asking the rest of us first. I don't have to consult with any of you first. I'm the lead beverage here, remember? There's a reason JC put me in charge, you know. He trusts me to make the hard decisions and make them quickly. Are you even listening to yourself, JC? What, are the two of you best buddies now? When you talk like that, I picture you in a crushed velvet jacket, swirling a snifter of brandy in one hand and a cigar in the other. What the hell happened to you, Rex? I used to look up to you, and now you want us to jump into bed with the US Army. I joined this team to bring joy to the world, not to create weapons of mass destruction. You know what, Kate? I expected more out of you. I really thought you'd jump at the chance to stop fooling around making soft drink flavors and play with the big boys for a change. I'll make this simple for you. Either you stop this emotional outburst and join the rest of us in reality, or I'm pulling you off the team. Go to hell, Rex. You'll have my resignation by the end of the month. So first of all, Rex is a dick. Second, Apparently the terminal is wrong and Ruth is actually Kate. I assume it's not the other way around given the recorded lines say Kate and it's unlikely that they, they were wrong and the terminal entries were right. This entry shows us that there was quite a bit of animosity between the two of them. Kate resented having been made to work with the US Army without consultation and felt Rex had changed from someone who, at one point, was presumably a friend or a mentor. Rex told her to get with the program or hit the bricks and she had no problem doubling down and saying she was leaving. This must have been in close proximity to the bombs hitting, as she was stuck here when they did. So Rex, what did Dr. Levitt say? It was like we expected. She won't be joining Project Cobalt. Didn't you tell her how important this is to the country? I mean, if she hasn't noticed, we are at war. I didn't even get that far in the conversation. She still thinks all we're doing here is making soda, for God's sakes. 
It's a shame, too, because she's the best organic chemist we have. I guess we'll just have to rely on Dr. Medford from now on. Wait, is she leaving? She's gonna walk away from all of this? She's not only walking away from her job here, she's blacklisting herself from our industry entirely. When I told JC about our chat, he blew his top, started ranting about how he took a chance on Dr. Levitt and she's throwing it back in his face. The man's connected, Kevin. He makes a few phone calls and by November she may as well hang up her lab coat for good. Damn. Remind me never to get on Brad Burton's bad side. The next entry is found on the counter, inside the living quarters. Recording AB30. This time, it's a conversation between Kevin and Rex. Presumably just shortly after Rex tried to convince Kate to stay, given the close proximity to the bombs, and the terminal entries predating that, saying they've been working for months. It can be assumed that Kate, and possibly the others, didn't know what they were doing. They may not have been aware from the start that they were working on Project Cobalt, or its ultimate purpose. The conversation with Kate seems to have happened after she found out. Rex states she'll be blacklisted if she walks away, but we know she never got the chance to do so. This is your last chance, Kate. I could still convince JC to keep you here if you just agree to join Project Cobalt. First of all, I'm not Kate to you. Not anymore. And second of all, no thanks. I'm done being your lab rat. I already have my things packed, and I'll be out of here by tomorrow. So until then, why don't you just stay out of my way? Come on, Dr. Levitt, be reasonable. After the U.S. wins this war, I'm sure they'll close Project Cobalt, and we can get back to making people happy. You're one of the most talented scientists I've ever had the pleasure of working with, and I really hate to see you go. I'm with Dr. Bennell. I mean, it's just not going to be the same without you here. I appreciate what you're both saying, but my mind's made up. Brad Burton might own half of Massachusetts, but I'll be damned if I'm going to let him own me. And if you two were smart, you'd both get out of here. What the hell is that alarm? What's that noise? Oh my god, it's happening. How could it be happening now? I thought we were winning this war. Have they launched missiles at us? I wish we could see what was going on outside. Oh my god. The door just sealed. We're stuck down here. What are you talking about? There's no way out? It's a built-in safety precaution. Brad Burton must have hit the panic button in his office. It seals all the high security areas up tight. His vault, our lab, the power plant's control center. All of it. We have to face facts. We might be down here for a long time. Well, Rex, looks like you got what you wanted. Next is recording AB35, found at one of the workstations in the lab. This recording takes place on the day the bombs dropped, the day Kate was meant to leave. Medford and Bennell make attempts to convince her to stay, both of them seeming a lot more reasonable than Meacham with even Rex making a last attempt to make her stay, saying JC will take her back again if she just agrees to join. Again, I find it odd that so much work was undertaken, yet she somehow didn't know its ultimate purpose. Clearly, Rex's attempt to satisfy Kate by putting her in charge, call it quantum development, didn't work. And given the true nature of the work, I don't know why he thought it would. He's also a bit thick. Um, they launched missiles because the Americans were winning? That's the point. It also tells us that Brad Burton's office is the key to unlocking a lot of the world, which you'd already know if you were down here, so it's a bit of a moot point. I don't care if Brad Burton made you the Pope. You're not telling me what to do anymore. We've been stuck down here for weeks. There's no Brad Burton anymore. There's no world anymore. No nothing anymore. Don't you get it, Rex? We're done. Humanity's done. We might be all that's left. And you want to continue working on this bullshit project? Why don't you wake up, Kate? You don't know what's going on out there. There could be soldiers right above us and we'd never know. Project Cobalt could be the thing that saves us. Saves America. 
We have to keep working. I wish the two of you would stop fighting. We need to keep level heads if we're going to survive. Look, Kate, maybe Rex is right. Maybe if we concentrate on our work, it'll take our mind off of things for a while. None of us want to end up like... like Dr. Medford. Look, I don't deny it's a shame what happened to Dr. Medford. But at least he kept his mind on his work. The fact of the matter is, he lost it. He was weak. He let his emotions take over. I don't want to see the same thing happen to you. You're crazy. At first, I thought you were just driven. But I was wrong. You're absolutely crazy. Why don't you pull out some of your secret recordings you've been making of us? You know, the ones you think we don't know about? Play them back and listen to yourself over the last few weeks. Listen to how goddamn insane you sound. Well, you know what? I'm done. I'm done with you, and I'm done hiding down here, waiting until you snap. Get away from the door controls, Kate. I'm not kidding. A gun? So what are you gonna do? You gonna shoot me now? Is that what this has come to? I said this to you a few months ago, and I'll say it again. Go to hell, Rex, and goodbye. Oh my god. You... you shot her. She's... she's gone. I had to do it, Kevin. She left me no choice. Now let's take care of this mess and get back to work. The last tape occurs just before, or literally during, Kate's murder by Rex. It's been several weeks, and she's had enough, and reveals that all these recordings were secret ones that Rex was making on all of them. She goes to leave, though I'm unsure of how she would have got out, given the power being out, and Rex just shoots her. He seems quite deluded at this point, thinking their work is going to save the country, which shows how far he's gone. He justifies why they should keep working by arguing it will stop them ending up like Medford, who he describes as weak, implying he isn't as he's still here. Another not so subtle justification of why he is superior, and definitely has a bit of a saviour complex now. To be fair, he is correct in that they have no idea what's going on above them, and doing some work may have kept their minds off of the reality that their world may have been totally gone. But it's clear he's gotten quite desperate, and he's built up his work into something it never really was, integral to America's survival. He had one lifeline, and Kate threatened it, so she just had to go. So Levitt and Medford are both gone, but what about Benel and Meacham? Well, their story, shockingly, didn't end much better, as the terminal entries already showed. We can find the conclusion to their story in the room off to the right of the main research lab. We can find a skeleton on the floor, beside a bench with a thirst sapper, and the results of the research down here, the weaponized quantum ordnance. Along with this, we find the means to make these lovely explosives, and a note explaining who this was, and what happened. The note is from Meachin, explaining how his work is finally complete. He's triggered the notification system for the military to come and get him out, and this happens after he chased Bennell into the reactor. He states he's just going to lie down and have a rest, as he's not feeling well. Clearly, chasing Bennell into the reactor adversely affected him, and given the skeleton, he clearly passed away shortly after he wrote this note. Or, at the very least, found himself unable to move from here. How he didn't have any Rad-X or rad -away, given what they were working on and the proximity to the reactor, I don't know. But maybe he wasn't thinking right at this point. If his notes and holotapes are any indication, I think that's a fair assessment. After all this, all that is left now is to find Benel. We can take the door to the immediate left of this room down into the reactor, and from here, into the underground tunnels that link up with Kitty Kingdom. I know what you're thinking. Could this have played a role into what happened there? It's entirely possible, but that's a story for another time. A little ways down the tunnel, we find a body beside a crate of Nicola Quantum. The gate is locked from this side, so there isn't really any way anyone else could have been down here. Additionally, we find some blood on the ground beside the body. Given the direction and blood, this is almost certainly Benel. As Meacham guessed, he didn't get very far, between the gunshot wounds and the radiation. Likely, after Kate was killed, he decided that it was only a matter of time until he was next, and so chose to make his own attempt at an escape. An attempt that ultimately failed, 
though then again, maybe he shouldn't have waited an entire year before he decided that Rex was probably going to try and kill him. The experiments down here took the lives of the whole team, and in the end, their work never helped to save America. Now, while the story of the beverage years ends here, there are still a few loose ends to wrap up, primarily outside the plant. If we start at the far end of the ditch, out the back of the plant, we can find a skeleton inside one of the trailers. We find a great deal of blood around it, and given the presence of it near the entrance, it seems like they were fatally injured there, and then dragged themselves here, likely to put a wall at their backs and give them a fighting chance against whatever it was that was trying to kill them. It may have been this hatchling, in which case, what a moron, or it could have been something else. At the other side of the ditch, we can find the remains of a camp. Now this is either that of the gunners, or one of the other various groups that, at different points, have attempted to conquer or claim structures around the world. Regardless, they're gone now. Up the stairs is a tank full of water, and inside, if you walk past it, two or kings will jump your ass. So if you're not sufficiently high level, that may be an issue for you. Now, up onto the roof. Straight ahead and to the right of the first large bottle monument, we can find what looks like an outdoor staff meeting area of sorts. Inside, we do find a clothed body. Now, given the remains of the meal, the lunchbox, and that they appear to have fallen out of a chair, this makes it likely they were an employee. Perhaps it's the Casey, that note we find mentioned. Or perhaps not. We don't know whether it was a man or a woman. However, it does look like the initial blast probably took their life, as it did the lives of some of the guests in the river below. Now, unless I've missed something, I can't really find much else of anything on this roof, apart from two other things I'm going to show you. The first is what looks like a larger, lived-in building on the far side of the roof. It has some survival equipment in it, and a mattress. However, it's also possible some of the employees just slept up here, and the other gear was being used for maintenance and the like. The final thing can be found on the other side of the blue dome opposite this building. Here, we come across two people. Women, if the clothing is anything to go on. They seem to have come up here to sightsee and have a few drinks, if the wine, camera, and, strangely, cola is anything to go on. However, look at the body placement. And on these two bodies, we can find wedding rings. And if you look closely, you will notice two things. The first is at least one of them, or both, died while holding the other one's hands, and the second is a locket, which appears to have a woman's picture inside of it. Given the distance the woman on the left is from her chair, I'd say it's more likely she died first, then was brought over by the woman on the right, who then passed away shortly after. It's fair to say, in my opinion, that they were likely married. Moreover, I think it's reasonable to assume that they hadn't planned on dying when they came up here. They likely came up here for a date, or an anniversary, or something related to that. And then the bombs hit, and one of them died in the arms of the other, before the last of the two passed away. I'm not sure if one of them was Casey, and then the other one could have been an employee that they called up here when they realized the world was burning down. But regardless, at least they both seem to have died with someone that they cared about. So, that's the story. On the surface, a cringy bit of PR by World on their various beverages and how they're made. Throw in some plugging for new, upcoming drinks, a bit of patriotism, and you've got a ride that a smooth brain parkour will stick their head into the river of and drink down your nonsense. But that wasn't all that was going on here. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, it was all just a front for the division of Project Cobalt. Four former beverageers, Levitt, Medford, Bennell and Meacham, were sequestered in a lab under the factory. Their goal was the conception and the weaponization of a compound that, after much trial and error, they called Quantum. This was in service to the American military and the wider park purpose, Project Cobalt, that we should cover in full another day. However, despite their early success, they hadn't finished stabilizing it. During this time, Levitt became enraged at Meacham, wanting to leave due to the nature of the work they were doing. As she attempted to, the bomb hit, and they ended up stuck with said work, and each other, for a long time. During this time, Medford took their own life, and no one, including Kate, seemed to care enough to remove the body, given the state that we found it in, without a head. Shortly after, Kate tried to leave, and Meacham, already well off the deep end at this point, took her life. 
he felt their work was the only thing that could save America. So, obviously, anyone who wasn't on board was a traitor. Bendel also made an attempt to get out, and Meacham tried to kill him too. In the end, he succeeded in taking both Bendel's life and Kate's, and finishing the work, before passing away shortly after. We are the only ones to really benefit from their research. Years later, the Gunners made an attempt to claim this building for their own, part of their wider mission in the world. This ended badly due to the mutagenic effect the quantum compound had on the Mirelurks, making them far stronger, more than the Gunners were prepared to handle at any rate. They were overrun, with the last one, Corporal Downey, leaving one last report before taking his own life, rather than be devoured by the creatures themselves. So, like many places that we came across, this cheerful attraction in an amusement park had a dark, dark secret. A group of researchers who became divided on the morality of the work, and eventually, whether at the hands of someone else's or their own, found their lives ended due to madness, hopelessness, and depression. Whether this was something they deserved, given the nature of their work, is something you'll have to decide for yourself. This theme of an underlying darkness in the world is going to continue as we explore this place, and their story is, unfortunately, not a unique one. The only difference this one has to many of these stories is that their deaths were in fact not in vain, because in the end, we reap the benefits of their work, and we got some new fancy grenades. So, what happened with the other video? Well, I was told after attempting a manual review that the video was age restricted due to speech that one could describe as hateful in nature. Now, since this is a video on a soft drinks factory in a fictional game, that didn't really make a lot of sense. So, I took a look at the auto generated closed captions. From what I can tell, it seems to be misflagging the word NUKA from NUKA Cola as something else. If you say it fast enough and then take my accent into account, I'm sure you can probably surmise what it likely thought I was saying. So, with any luck, this version of the video won't get flagged. Anyone who has come back to watch it again and support it, I thank you. For all of you seeing it for the first time, I hope it was enjoyable for you. It was, until my previous video on supernatural locations, the longest lore video I have made, I think. I'll have more content out very soon, so stay tuned. I will now hand you off to the me of a few months ago for the closing statements. Okay guys, so um, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's the first in what will be many videos exploring several areas in Fallout. I am back, I know I've said that before, I know people have been patient and have waited, but I said I would get this out in the first or the second uh, weekend of December, and I've done that. After this, we're going to be doing a kind of a compilation video on a few spooky, spooky areas, a few creepy areas. I already covered that in my previous update video, and I've made a post about that in the community section. There will also be some uh, Elden Ring videos. I'm currently playing through both Death Stranding, Control, and Deathloop, so I can get enough of the story and footage together for those to start making some videos. That'd be Prey as well, we'll have to see. And as for this video, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope this seems like a return to form for me. I know it's been a while since I've done just one video that covered a spooky area, but this was in high demand, and uh, yeah, I hope it met your expectations. I do plan to cover more of these soon, and there will be a few of them that are going to be revisited, because those videos are seven or eight years old, and the standard is quite low compared to today. And uh, yeah, look forward to that. I hope you enjoy this one, and I hope to see you in the next one. And until then, goodbye.